Okay, welcome to Math 152. Uh, these videos are meant to highlight what we're going to talk about in class. They by no means take the place of class. I just kind of focus on the main idea. We cover a lot more stuff in class, so you still have to come to class. Um, I also go really, really fast because I try to cover a lot of ideas, so you're probably going to have to hit your pause button. Okay, so get ready. Uh, first topic here in 4.9 we're going to look at is the definition uh, we say f, big F, is an antiderivative of little f on an interval i if when you take the derivative of, of big F you get little f for all x and i. We always talk about an antiderivative on an interval. So what I'm, what I'm looking for is a function whose derivative is x cubed. I want, uh, big, when you take the derivative of big F you get little f. So some of you would say, oh, well, how about x to the fourth? That's a pretty good guess. But actually the derivative of big F would be 4x cubed. You want x cubed. So x to the fourth over four would be the function. But it turns out there's lots of functions. Wouldn't this function also work? If you take the derivative of this function, you'd get x cubed, because the derivative of five is zero. In fact, you could, um, you could uh, take the derivative of any function x to the fourth over four plus a constant where, where c could be any real number. We call this the most general antiderivative of x cubed. All right, so that's, that's the definition. The most general antiderivative would be um, any antiderivative plus some arbit arbitrary constant. Okay? So it, on your homework, if it says find the most general antiderivative, uh, don't forget the plus c. So let's, let's practice these guys then. What's the most general antiderivative of 5x squared? Well, it turns out the 5 factors out just like it does with the derivative, and so it'd be 5, you'd add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. So it'd be 5x to the third over 3 plus c. You see the pattern? You add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. That's, that's how you find the antiderivative of x to a power. All right, so what's, what's the most general antiderivative of x to the fourth minus 11? Uh, it turns out you can, you can find the antiderivative of each and add them together. The pattern is the antiderivative of x to the fourth would be x to the fifth over five, and the antiderivative of negative eleven would be negative eleven x plus c. Don't forget the plus c. Uh, we can go backwards. What if I give you the most general antiderivative and I want you to find the function? I give you big F and I want you to find little f. Well, that's actually easier because isn't the derivative of big F little f? So you should just get twenty x to the third plus. 6x plus 0 because the derivative of the constant is 0. Okay, try this one. See if you can tell me what the most general antiderivative is of x squared plus 5x minus 3. Hit the pause button. Should have gotten x to the third over 3, add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, plus 5x squared over 2 minus 3x plus c. What's the most general antiderivative of 4? I'm on a function whose derivative is 4, be 4x plus c, where c is any real number. What's the most general antiderivative of e to the x? It would be e to the x plus c. Now, technically, when we talk about antiderivative, we're talking about an interval. The interval here would be all real numbers, okay? The interval i we're talking about, this, this antiderivative, every antiderivative of e to the x will be of this form for all real numbers. This is the interval we're talking about. Okay, let's keep on going. What's the most general antiderivative of sine x? I'm on a function whose derivative is sine x. You might say cosine x, but that's not right. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. So how about negative cosine x plus c? And if, if I were to say on what interval is that true? Uh, this, would be, this would be true on the interval all, all real numbers. What's the um, most general antiderivative of cosine x? It'd be sine x plus c. What's the most general antiderivative of secant tangent? I want to find a function whose derivative is secant tangent. Remember? Secant of x plus c. Now in terms of an interval here, the interval will be kind of messy because secant of x is not defined whenever x equals 2n plus 1 multiple of pi over 2, right? Whenever the cosine is 0. So you would have, you would have actually separate intervals here. And, and it turns out this constant could be different on each of the intervals. So it's pretty subtle, but it's not worth worrying about right now. We'll talk about that more in class. Tell me the most general antiderivative of secant squared. It's tangent of x plus c. What's the most general antiderivative of 1 over x to the fourth? Remember, that's x to the negative fourth. 
So what you do is you add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. So if you simplify it, you get negative 1 over 3x to the third plus c. So we're ready to generalize now. What, what, is the, what is the rule if you want to find the most general antiderivative of x to a power, any real number except not equal to, one, not equal to negative 1? You add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, plus c. So hit the pause button. See if you can tell me what the uh, most general antiderivative is of 3x squared minus 5 over x squared. Let's see. The 3 factor is out. You add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. Here you think of this as 5x to the negative 2. So when you add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, you get this. So when you simplify, you get this. Okay, this one's kind of subtle. What's the most general antiderivative of 1 over x? Well, some of you would say natural log of x. And that's half right. The reason why I say half right is because what happens if x is negative? If x is negative, then the natural log of x is not defined. So it would be better, um, it turns out, you might not remember this from Math 151, but this function right here, natural log absolute value of x, if x is greater than 0, it just equals the natural log function. If x is less than 0, it equals the natural log of negative x. If you dif differentiate natural log of x, you get 1 over x. If you differentiate natural log of negative x, you also get 1 over x. So it turns out this is, this is a more general answer because this, this one's valid for all x not equal to 0. Technically, we're talking about two intervals here, right? There's an interval where x is greater than 0, interval where x is less than 0, and technically you could have a different constant. It doesn't have to be the same constant of integrate, the, the same uh, constant here. Um, on each interval. They could be different constants even. That would be more general. But again, that's not a big deal. Wouldn't worry about that too much. Look at this function. I'm giving you the derivative and I want you to find f. Do you understand? This is just another way of saying I'm giving you the, I want you to find the antiderivative of this function here. Alright, well, sometimes you may have to play around with the function before you find the antiderivative. You, you, could, re you could break this up and say x over square root of x, which is this, minus 4 over square root of x, which is this. Now you could find the antiderivative of each. Remember the antiderivative, you add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. Here you add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. When you simplify this, you get 2x to the, 2x to the 3 halves over 3 minus 8x to the 1 half plus c. Nice, huh? All right, here, this is a nice one. Let's do this last one here. Okay, so I'm giving you the second derivative. I'm giving you f double prime of theta is sine theta. I'm giving you that f of theta is 0, f, f, I should say f prime of theta is 0, and f of theta is 2, and I want you to find the function f of theta. So what we're going to do is we're going to use anti-differentiation twice. If you use anti-differentiation once, you go from f prime of theta to f, I should say f double prime of theta to f prime of theta, the, the most general antiderivative of sine theta would be negative cosine theta plus c1. Now how do you find that constant? We're going to plug in the fact that f prime is 0 is 0. So you're going to plug in 0 for theta, and we're given that f prime of theta is also 0. So what, what does c1 have to equal then? c1 would then equal um, 1, wouldn't it? Because cosine of theta, co cosine of 0 is 1, so c1 has to equal 1. So then you plug that in, and you get that uh, you get that f prime of theta equals negative cosine of theta plus 1. Now we go, now we anti-differentiate one more time, and we get that f of theta, antiderivative of negative cosine theta would be negative sine theta. And then the antiderivative of 1 is theta, and you pick up another constant. Now how do you find c2? Well, you use the fact that f of 0, you're given that f of 0 is 2 here, see? f of 0 is 2. So when you plug in 0 for theta, here and here, and you plug in 2 for f of theta, these two drop out and you get that c2 equals 2. So your final answer would be that uh, the function f of theta is negative sine theta plus theta plus 2. That's it. We will be doing that some more, so make sure you're able to do that last problem. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.